so uh, why, why did I name the company Spin? Um, essentially, it's because I wanted to be a cricketer. And uh, I, 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 so I'm, I came up with um, the idea, lots of names for, for the studio, um, and I tried them all on the phone, tried saying them on the phone, and it was the only one that I could say without feeling a deep sense of embarrassment was, uh, was spin. So that's why, it's, that's why we're called spin. Um, nothing to do with politics or anything, anything like that. Essentially, we've just moved out of what was a very nice um, professional studio environment into this. <laughs> and uh, we, we, we still don't know quite what to call it. It's, we keep calling it a shed or a pod. But it's, I mean, it's under floor heating, so it's not really a shed. But essentially, I'd always wanted to be, um, to have a, a studio at home. And so we, this, is, this was our attempt to do that. It's a kind of kit-built thing. It's got underfloor heating. It's very nice. After three, one, two, three. So that's, that, you have to take my word for it because it's so dark you can't see him. But that was Lance Wyman, a famous American um, designer, opening the, uh, the new studio. Um, he did the Mexico 1968 Olympics. We're very pleased to have him. Unfortunately, all you can see is darkness, but never mind. He's, I know he was there. <laughs> um, but uh, the, the, I suppose the worry about, about moving to the studio was that we might sort of relax and think it was a bit of a holiday, that we could just chill out. And, and that, so that was a genuine concern. Fortunately, it hasn't been like that at all. It's been the exact opposite. It probably put the fear of God in us, and we're, we're, we're busy making a lot of work, some of which I'm going to show you now. So we've been there for about six months, and we've been busy churning out work. It's been lovely to do. It's brought us all closer together as a studio. It's been a really nice thing to do, really positive. This is uh, moving in. It's amazing how much crap you accumulate over. I'm sure you all know the feeling. Uh, we bought a lot of furniture from Ikea, which I don't... Do you get Ikea here? Yeah. It's a pain in the ass. <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, this, is, this is Ned, our new, new uh, studio member. He's very, very good at table tennis. We didn't really get the full... You don't get really get full end, but you can actually play a game with him. <laughs> he hates it when he misses. And this is how he's normally uh, transported. <laughs> um, so we've got, this, we've got this environment now where it, we've got a nice professional working space, and we've also got a space where we can experiment and play. And that's always been really important to me, and it's something that I really enjoy. You know, I, I sort of, my, my morning commute is about 30 seconds from here to about there. And um, it's... It just seems to have a spirit about it, which is encouraging us to make, make things. Um, we, every, this is, this is a, a campaign that I've been running for a while now. It's to encourage people every Thursday to have a Friday. So what that means is every Thursday, you do a cooked breakfast together. So let me know how you get on. But... We, 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 we're cooking together now Thursdays and Fridays. So on, on Friday, someone from the studio gets nominated to cook. And on Thursdays, we do the fried breakfast. But it's a, it's a very nice social thing to do. So I thought it might be nice to try and explain the process, because every time, every time I describe the process, our, our working process, I, I kind of align to spinning plates, so we kind of made this little um, diagram. So essentially, my, my working day is split up between spin and unit additions. Now, we also do so client work, and we used to say unit additions is a publishing company that makes um, books on visual culture that we started, I don't know, six years ago, something like that. And 
I really enjoy it, but it's not really a self-initiated project now. That's, that's, it's a proper publisher's. You know, I, could, I, could, I can call myself a publisher, I don't know if I want to, but I can call myself a publisher. Um, so, self-initiated projects has always been something that new things stem, out, stem from. So, as, as we go on, this, this element of play will become clear, really. But I just wanted to show you some of, the, the, some of our commissioned work first to get the balance between the two things. So Ministry of Sound is a club in South London. Um, and we were asked to, um, to look at this project by Es Devlin, who you might have seen earlier this week, fantastic um, designer, maker of amazing environments. And she, she brought us in to look at the identity, the new identity. Um, so, what you have on the, the left is, is what they were, and on the right is what, what we designed. Um, it's, it's interesting that they, they, they couldn't bear the idea of getting rid of the old logo, so that they're working, in, they're working together at the moment in partnership. But hopefully one day they'll, they'll be brave and lose the old one. This is a, a visual for a, a clock we wanted to do, a, a Ministry of Sound watch. But what I liked was the idea that, that it could be any of these shapes. In, in today's world, identities really need that kind of flexibility of language because they have, they have to appear on so many different things. They have to appear on um, in print still. There's still a lot of print, but there's also a lot of screen-based stuff that they have to appear on. And so the idea of them being in, inherently entertaining in some way is, is a good thing. So, uh, you know, the playfulness, the attitude that you can communicate by playing with them is really important. And also the, the idea that they, they're not one particular color that they can move and develop is really important too. Some fly posters. And this was a kind of happy accident we discovered along the way was is that once, the, once you've established those brackets, you can put anything inside them, even a, a bat. <laughs> and uh, it still recognize what it is, essentially. So that's how the identity kind of behaves at the moment. So uh, this is um, University of the Creative Arts. Is, is, is a, a university out, just outside London, it has four campuses, and um, we did a real uh, big, deep uh, exploration of the, the campus. Now, I've, I've got a confession to make. I have, I have nightmares about being back at, at art college. Um, it, I know what I know now, but the tutor doesn't know that I know what I know now, and I'm explaining to them, it's recurring, this, <laughs> this nightmare. It is so frustrating. And they go, no, 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 you don't, you know, you got to do, do it the way I say. So anyway, this, this kind of process helped me, um, it was therapy for me, basically. It helped me get over this. Um, but is it just me, or, or can you see a penis in the A? <laughs> because... Once you've seen it, you can't unsee it. It's, uh... <laughs> and this, this is their original, this, is, this isn't the logo that I designed, them. this is the original one. But we went through this whole process and it was really hard to keep a straight face, to be honest, because... <laughs> I think you get where I'm coming from. <laughs> um... <laughs> But anyway, so, I, you know, besides putting the penis to one side for a minute, which I bet nobody said this week, um, I, walking around the, the university was really wonderful. It was a real, real experience for me, and it took me back to the place of my, the, the core of my nightmares and reminded me of how wonderful these places actually are. They're great. I mean, they're just places that are made for making. So... In, I was taking these photographs as I was walking around um, as a way of kind of introducing the staff back to the excitement that they felt when they first started working for the university. Because they'd become maybe a little jaded or whatever, but they were, 
there were really wonderful, fantastic people who just needed to be reminded, maybe, that, that of what, what a great environment they were working in. Um, but I also fell for it as, as, as I was doing this. Um, so, in the conversations that we had, um, there was a lot of talk about making. That, that, that's something that, that was the one thing that all parties agreed with, whether lecturers, um, students, all the, all the interested parties, they all agreed that making was the exciting thing. And so basically I was looking for some kind of symbol for making, and the, the idea came up of, of stencil. stencil. Stencils are what architects put in their plans, they use it on their plans traditionally, um, and, it's, and it's a signifier of things in progress, that things are always in progress and not finished. And I really like that idea. I like the idea of an identity that could, could continue year after year, developing and moving and, you know, keep going, really. And this is kind of the first stencil. I'm stretching it a bit, I know, but... So this is the, the, the first iteration of the mark that, that I made. And then you have to see, so that's a very, that's, I, I basically call that a, a seed. So that's the seed, thought, the core thought is stencil. After that, how far can it go? How, how, how far can you push it? So this is our studio wall. We always share, for anybody who works as, as a designer, I think this is, one piece of advice I can happily give is that once, once, once you've taken it out of the computer and stuck it on a wall, you can really look at it properly and start to think about it. When it's in a computer, it can always move, it can always go a little bit bigger, a little bit to the left, a little bit down, you can change the color a myriad of times, but once you, put, once you print it out, you, you not only can start to make decisions about it, you also can include other people in your conversation too, so it's just an important part of what we do. I just realized how weird we look doing this. It's like, you know, just really wanting to get as much out of it as you possibly can. So this is, this is the way that the, the, the core identity exists now. It's flexible, it can be square, it can be long, it can be reduced to just the lines at the bottom. And in 2015, the first, first year that we did it, this is, this, is the, this is how the visual language looked. This is, these are the numbers that were on the back of the football team. And then in 2016, it gets developed a little more and, you know, but there's still, there's still some common, common themes. The colors are still very strong, but it's a, made a little more complex. And in 2017, we go three-dimensional because the courses, they do graphics courses and things like that, but they also do architecture as well, and we thought that is important to do that, so we start to extrapolate it and play, play with the logo in that way as well. So the idea really is that every single year it can keep on being developed, it can keep on refreshing itself. And that's what a, a creative university should do, should be able to do. That's a prospectus.
And we've just finished some super graphics on the wall, which are always great fun to do. So this is uh, an Epsom and a student cafe. And um, this is a different kind of thing. Google, Google Ideas essentially is, um, is a kind of division of, of Google. And the idea is that they have some of the best engineers in the world there and um, that they make softwares that are going to protect people who are working in uh, difficult circumstances in countries where uh, freedom of speech isn't necessarily recognized and it, the idea is that they, that they make software that protects their activities, uh, their digital activities. It were called Google Ideas, and they renamed to Google Jigsaw. So again, you see, like this, this is um, how the mod this modular system works, and you can make maps out of it, and you can make patterns out of it. And you make letter forms out of it. And every time you, do, every time you make that, you're still, it's still essentially the same core visual that it has. And this is something that we've just done for BBC Creative, which is the creative department of the BBC. Um, so when we, when we got the brief for this, I, um, I, I looked at the, the uh, BBC charter, and it puts creativity very, very highly in the BBC charter. Um, it said it's core to all activities that they do. Um, it's, it's the, their ambition is to be one of the most creative broadcasters in the world. And the way that I thought of that was that, okay, the, their identity is a square, three squares, and that the four square should be creativity. So it started off with uh, trying to make a, a more dimensional square, and then realizing that if you knock an edge off the square, you make a C. So essentially it's BBCC. But again, with, with this visual language, you can, you can carry on playing and extrapolating out from it and making uh, expressive visual language without ever losing the concept. And, of course, you can try to push it until it breaks. I do love a rubber stamp. You can probably tell. These are their offices. If I ever have to have another job, it might be doing this. It just looks incredibly satisfying, rubbing, <laughs> rubbing down the uh, vinyls and then pulling off that sheet. It's like opening up an iPhone or something. And so BBC have just done a new, uh, a new typeface, made a new typeface. It's been used in the making, called BBC Reith. Um, Reith was the founder of the BBC, the first uh, director general. And he set the, the he made the, the kind of parameters with, with, within which the BBC works. And we were asked to uh, create a, a series of posters that celebrated the, this font and I suppose the thinking behind it is it's really important that the organization buys into this font and wants to use it. And it's a very elegant font, but it's got a lot more scope than the, the, the Gil Sands that they were using. So hopefully this will be successful and people will really start to use it. 
We also made a series of moving posters which appear on big screens around the buildings. Which my team are just going to shoot today, actually, while I'm here. So really, they're all about showing the breadth and flexibility of this, this typeface. And then we have uh, Unit Editions, which is a publishing company. So it's a big part of my life now. I've, I've always felt that um, graphic design didn't really do itself justice, that we, that we would make all these incredible, incredibly rich books for the likes of architects and artists, but not really um, do the same for ourselves. And that was a constant source of frustration to me. So you know, we started to, started to make, make the books that I believed needed to be made, and it, it stemmed from a, an experience I had with a, a commercial publisher where I worked out that after we'd finished this book, I not only had to make compromises at every single step along the way, but also I'd pay for the privilege of doing it because you get paid so little to do it, and I thought, well, if I'm going to lose money, I at least ought to really believe in what I made. And, um, and so I'm in the position of doing that now. I wouldn't say we're making money, but we're not losing money. So these are just some examples of the books that we made. And they're all, they're all based on uh, graphic design in one way or another. So a big part of moving, moving to this, this, the pod shed thing at the bottom of the garden was the opportunity to, for more more play, get, to get out of the off the computer more often. And it's something that we, we do quite a lot now. Is We don't necessarily run straight to the computer when we're making something. We, we'll, we'll start to, to play around with materials as well as part of the process. One of the things that we've, we've started to do is to make a publication called um, Adventures in Typography, which kind of forces us, but it's a kind of journal and we, we try and get two or three out a year, and it forces us to experiment with form. And essentially in this particular instance, it's can you make a typeface where everything is wrong and still read it? Um, we call it Alien Feature Font. We, we also, as, as part of the thing, we, we, we you know, might have noticed in the slides earlier there was a garden and uh, there were lettuce leaves in the garden. And so I got to wondering, could you make a typeface out of letters and call it Lettuce Letters? <laughs> <laughs> for, for no other reason than it sounds funny. Um, so this is Lettuce Letters. It's like Pac-Man or something. And a little bit of playing around with that. Imagine, imagine that Helvetica is stuffed away in a drawer somewhere, um, just like drawing gray, and every time it gets abused, it gets a little more knackered, it gets a little older. And we call this Helvetica Alt, because Alt is old in German, as well as alternative. just gets a little more crinkled, a little older, a little more tired. So this, this, this short film was, um, we had this idea that Helvetica was going to be thrown away. And so we, we had this idea that we would cut the letters out and throw them on the floor and it would read alt. We did this for hours. <laughs> it just could not make it work. So we ended up having to arrange it on the, on the thing. And even then we couldn't get it in the middle. Um, but you know, it's one of those things when you're convinced it's going to work and it just doesn't. Um, so that's as close as it got. And then, so that, that led on to the thought that if, if Helvetica is, is, is old and tired, and um, I've got to say now, I like Helvetica before all this abuse starts out, um, that, you know, could we, could we bring some new life into it? 
So Dr. Frankenstein's Helvetica, we perform an operation on it. <laughs> and <laughs> so we, we made all these letters, hundreds and hundreds of letters actually, it was great fun to do, and made a kind of a a playful thing out of that. Sadly, it, it died on the, on the operating table. And, um, and so we had to, um, we, this, this is some abuse that it's had on the, on the internet. Uh, we, anyway, like we, so we, um, we thought that because it, it had died, so I, I imagined that we'd go to its funeral and that its ashes would be spread. And just as its ashes have been spread, just for a moment, you'd be able to read it for one last time. So this is another stupid pun. So we'd had this idea, I, I, sorry, I, I had this idea that you could, put, you could stick gaffer tape to your head and make tight faces that make your head a different shape, but we found out that they kind of pull your eyebrows off. And, um, <laughs> and so we, we had to go with um, uh, black nylons, which nylons, I don't know if you've ever tried this, um, but when, when, if you put nylons on your head and then try to stick anything to it, they don't stick. So, things you find out. And so, this is why I've got that nylon stuck to my head. We ended up having to wrap around sellotape to make them stick to the, stick to, stick to the head. But, there you go. And stripey. I don't think we're going to be able to do stripey because I want to show you. I want to show you uh, fingers. So this is what it sounds like. It's typeface made out of fingers. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.